Good evening and welcome to um, A School Called the Universe, episode eight. And that'll be this will be the final episode of the School Called the Universe series. And I must say, I woke up this morning wondering why I do this. Why do I write? Why do I write books? Why do I blog? Why do I share this understanding or teach? And I honestly don't know. Um, I guess it's a way that I remember what I am, what we all are, um, remember our shared beingness, remember our indivisible self. And um, I think it comes natural, but I do often question why I do it. What we always have to ask, and that's the most important thing, if we're ever on, on some form of journey or some sort of seeking, is to ask ourselves the question, what is anything for? You know, so why is it that we search for meaning or purpose um, or wanting to know Christ or wanting to know God or wanting to know the reason for existence or the nature of our being? Why is it that we do all of this? And ultimately, as much as I've searched and questioned and researched, it comes down to one basic thing, and that is that we all want to be happy permanently. We want to be peaceful. We want peace in our lives. And we want a sense of security, and, and, and we want to share ourselves and have companionship and feel loved and love. And more importantly, we want to love the ones we want to love. And we want to feel loved by the ones we love. It's all fair and well that complete strangers say they love you. But if the people you love don't love you, then there's a problem. And so we're all searching. We're all searching for an understanding, a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, and once we start our spiritual, spiritual, inverted commas, because I don't like the word spiritual. Um, I think spirituality is, is a myth and more, more, more appropriately is a misappropriation by our ego body mind identity that uses the term spirituality as an identification and a sense of specialness. Um, and then, and as a consequence to that, then a sense of belonging to a certain tribe. And before you know it, you've gone straight back into judgment and separation. But ultimately, we all searching for perpetual happiness or joyous peace, as I like to call it. And I make a distinction between happiness and joy as happiness being an egoic fleeting moment and joy being an eternal expression of true self. So why do we do this? Why do I do this? There's a question I'm constantly asking myself, constantly. And what is it for? What is the purpose of sharing this? I'm certainly not trying to convert anyone or destroy their ideas and beliefs. Although that's, the, that's exactly what happens if you start sharing this understanding to those who have ears of the heart and what are looking for a more plausible um, explanation as to why we find ourselves here and what is it all about and what is God and what are we supposed to do about all of this? So what, to, what I'm going to share with you tonight is really 56 years of my history in terms of my journey summarized into a path and of course it's my own unique path and i can share it as a possible mirror to your own and a possible road sign for you but there's many ways to get to rome and mine is just one specific path but of course if you use it and apply it to your own life in your own unique way make use of whatever works for you, throw the rest away, add add to your pathway from whatever's worked for you, 
wherever you've obtained it, make it your own, you'll find that it will bring you clarity because those who ask shall find, seek and ye shall find. It's been said by Jesus and many other teacher before me. What I came to understand as a revelation dawned upon me and, and there was this transformation of understanding that came about is it wasn't anything that I was, I'd never imagined that what happened to me was even possible. And as I look back on it now, I can look back with total clarity and complete understanding. It's, it's so clear. In actual fact, sometimes it's a little embarrassing because it was so obvious. How could I not have seen it? But we don't. And as I stand here now, present in this present moment awareness of self, very aware of what my self is and that the self I am shares itself with everything in this universe with total clarity. There's not even a, an inkling of a doubt there. And as I look upon it, I see there's it's a threefold, three, threefold path, threefold journey. And the first step of the journey was our journey away from God, prodigal son. Running away from the safety and joy and peace of his father's kingdom. Why? Because we thought there was something else out there. Something else that could be discovered. Something else that could be made manifest. Something else that could be explained. A sense of individuality. A sense of uniqueness. A sense of adventure. It's built into the curiosity of a child. And so the first part of the journey is our journey away from God, where we forget completely what we are. No idea as to why we're here. And then we accumulate all sorts of experiences and skills and talents and a myriad of tools, and yet they'll all fail us. Everything in this world will fail you. Everything, every relationship in some way or another, even if it's the most perfect relationship, one of you dies before the other. You have children because you, well, because people want to have children. They don't know why they want to have children. They want children. And they hope that those children will bring them joy. And how many parents are truly happy with their children? Because children end up wanting their own thing, which is often in contradiction to what the parents want. And at some stage, they're going to have to get up and go. And they're going to test you as they move into their teens because you're the sounding board. And how many people that have had children end up being disappointed because their children aren't what they wish they would be? And vice versa, how many children are disappointed in their parents because their parents haven't turned out to be what they'd hoped they'd be? And then we get to a point where nothing makes us happy. Not the career, not the job, not the car, not the money, not the wealth, not the fame, the fortune, the popularity, none of it. It all just becomes meaningless. Food has no more taste. You lose all sense of passion for anything. And if you're lucky, it, you get there because it's just dreadful. If you're lucky, it's because it's dreadful. It's way more difficult if you get there because everything is just fantastic and everything works and everything loses its flavor because it's too easy. It's easier to get there because everything fails. Because it's only then that you really look up at the heavens wherever the heavens are supposed to be or you shout at your imagined God and say there has to be another way. And even that isn't enough because you really have to get to that final point of complete and total surrender, complete and total surrender. And you'll notice something like the Course of Miracles doesn't talk about surrender because if it did, it would just frighten 90% of the readers. We hate the idea of surrender because surrender sounds like giving up. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that you are giving up. You're giving up your false identity. You're giving up your illustrious fantasies and dreams 
because no matter how often you dream, they fail you. And there's the beauty. And then your journey towards God begins. Now, at first, again, like I said, everybody may say they're looking for God. If you could even join a monastery, become a nun or a monk or whatever. You know, I want a journey with God. But you're really just looking for happiness. You're just looking for per perpetual joy because God remains a concept. As Nietzsche said, God is dead. Long live God. And they slaughtered him for it because they didn't understand what he was talking about. And he was talking of the concept of God at the time was dead. And there was a new concept of a new God, of a God seen in a different way. And God dies to us daily as we ascend in awareness and redefine what we imagine God should be. Only to be disappointed as soon as you discover a new way of looking at it. And that's what religion is is, is happening to religion and why it seems to fail. Because... The concept that religion sells is failing and it has no answers. And so as the journey to God commences, we go through a myriad of, besides reading every single book we can or attending as many retreats as we can and trying all the different processes from meditation to prana and whatever, breathing. And we try all these, the we try the astrologies and the astronomies and and the tarots and the angel cards and listening to the gurus and traveling to India to eat, pray, love, and hopefully get shagged on the way and meet the love of your life because now it's going to be all fulfilling when you meet the love of your life, which, of course, it never lasts. But it's only when the journey to God is complete, once the total clarity complete awareness of your essential nature, the knowing of what you are with total clarity. Only once that is done, then the third part of the journey begins. And, and you will go into that journey with trepidation. You will go with confusion. And you'll wonder why you're doing it. Because there is no purpose and there is no meaning and there is no reason and there is no function really. And all of it is completely meaningless and purposeless because you'd never needed to leave your father's kingdom and you haven't, but you're still dreaming that you have. And then your journey with God begins because you realize father and son are one. I and my father are one. I did this to myself. I'm doing this to myself. And then you'll you'll really ask start asking the right questions. Why? What is it all for? Why have I done this? And if you're very, 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 very lucky and you stumbled across the direct path, at least you'll then have the tools and the understanding and the knowing beyond understanding, the true knowing. Because you don't stand under anything anymore. And the clarity comes and you'll have the clearest technique as to how to get away from the constant temptation of the ego. And the temptation of the ego is not to go out and sin and cause havoc. The temptation is always to be trapped by the egoic misperceived, misperceived filters of sin, fear, and guilt, abandonment, rejection, unworthiness, what everybody experiences. But once the clarity is set in and it's clear, I am this, and all that appears is the activities of my dream, and I'm aware I'm dreaming now. So lucid dreaming. I'm aware all of this is me appearing as the illusion of space, time, and matter, appearing as the illusion of the universe, this world, people, places, things, and events. The appearances of all of it is me. Parts of myself I rejected and pushed away and then blamed them for my misery. When I realize all of it's me, how can I not but serve? 
all of it. Since I now am aware, I dream, and therefore I'm responsible for my expression in dream. And through my expression, bring the light of awareness into the dream so the rest of my fractured siblings, characters in my dream can awaken to the knowing. Because not a single character leaves the dream. The dream cannot end while a single character still has unresolved issues, unforgiven thoughts. Because the characters don't really have the thoughts. The characters are just playing out the unforgiven thoughts of a dreaming mind that forgot it is the extension, son of God. And this is wonderful. This is, sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Philosophical. It's like a lecture. Like a TED lecture. What's he ranting on about? Much ado about nothing. But if we truly want the truth, you're never going to find it in a book. You're not going to find it in an ashram, not a guru, not a society, not a circle. Uh, not a teacher. You're not going to find the truth. At best, you're going to find pointers. Because you then have no choice but to seek the evidence for yourself. Now, let's look at, let's turn to science. Quantum, quantum physics. Quantum physics in the 50s already proved that physical matter doesn't exist. You can go into particles and subatomic particles and, and go even deeper. And eventually there's just air. There's nothing. Appearing as something, vibrating, taking shape, feeling solid. Appearing to have a mind of its own. But quantum physics has proven without a shadow of a doubt that everything that appears is just an illusionary play on light. A play of light appearing as particles. Vibrating at a frequency that appears to be real. It appears to have effects on other particles. Quantum mechanics proves that when two particles collide, they share of each other, they share of each other. And when they bounce off each other again, they're never the same because they've given off of each other. And if they're all bouncing into each other, they're all sharing self with self. Quantum physics has proven that. Quantum thermodynamics has proved our energy transfers from one particle to the next, and they share energy. That's science, just condensed into a couple of sentences. Science has proven that space, time, matter are illusionary concepts, constructs that cannot be pinpointed and found. Infinity cannot be measured. But the awareness that seems to be conscious, the awareness, right-mindedness, Christ mind, that seems to be conscious, dream state. The awareness that seems to be conscious of space, time, and matter is unquestionable. Yes, there's a lot that everything's an illusion. Nothing really exists. Really? Do you doubt? Do you doubt your own existence? Your stories, perhaps, but your existence, do you doubt it? Or is that unquestionable? What makes you search? What makes you question what happens to us after we die? There's a knowing, because if someone says nothing, it just goes back to nothing. Nothing? Or does it return to something? Does it return to its source? Its God, its creator? Or nothing? Am I really aware of nothing? Yet science quantum proves that nothing material, nothing appearing physical can last forever. Its appearance is or everything that appears and disappears is continually changing. So when is it true? When is it perfect? Never. 
Nothing material lives forever. Nothing for, lives forever in space-time. And when you realize space-time isn't real, well, then nothing actually exists. Yet everything is. And that's where the confusion comes in. Everything that appears and disappears cannot prove reality, absolute reality, but it proves a form of reality which is questionable. And it's questionable because it's temporal, ethereal, forever changing, never constant, unreliable. Laws change all the time. The world was a better place before women got the vote. <laughs> now the more intelligent species are in charge soon. <laughs> How dare they? Nothing exists. Our sun has a lifespan, which means our universe has a lifespan. So science proves that what appears isn't real. But science cannot prove that what observes and is aware of what appears and disappears. Science cannot measure that. And that's where the mystics come in. The ancients, the ancient teachings, the metaphysical. Ooh, big word, Lou. Metaphysical. Mythology. Parapsychology. Ooh, just a bunch of propeller heads cooked. What are you, what, what are you feeling and sensing and seeing? No one else can see it. You're just imagining it. So let's just go into the direct experience, your own direct. I'm not going to tell you anything you haven't heard before. Perhaps not in these words, but you know this. Look at your own life experience, your own direct experience of the life you've lived. There's never been a yesterday and there's never a tomorrow. There's always now here. You may talk of a yesterday and talk of a tomorrow, but you're always now here. You cannot doubt your beingness, that from which you look, that which observes. If you, if I say you go back to the time you were 10 years old, imagine yourself at your birthday, ten, your, your 10th birthday party. There you are, but you're still there now here. You have no idea where you come from. Physically, yes, your parents. But there's a sense of you that's existed before you came into form. Everyone has that sense because of their beliefs they don't question. But everybody has that sense. I existed before I came into form and I will exist after this. Even the atheist that says when you die, you're dead. But you melt with the plants and then something part of you lives with the plants forever. <laughs> or if you got eaten by a shark. You become shark poo. So something still continues and the shark poo goes into the ocean. And so there's still a part of you. So even the atheist doesn't believe it ends with the finality. You have no idea where you come from, where you're going. But there's, there's a sense that there was something and there will be. You have no idea where the desire for joy and peace comes from. You know where the idea for adventure and excitement and specialness comes from, because it comes from the, your imagination. But you have very seldomly imagined peaceful joy, silent stillness, eternal silent stillness and peaceful joy. Your imagination cannot grasp it. You cannot conceive of eternal. Eternity seems too far away, just forever. Your brain can't compute eternally here now, always now. And so you have no idea where this desire for joy and peace comes from. Yet, it's real for you. You know without a shadow of a doubt that it is real because you desire it. 
So it must be. It's in your makeup. And you've heard all the motivational speakers say to you, if you can imagine it, it must be already in you. Well, if you if you desire peaceful joy, at some stage prior to your thoughts, feelings, and, and sensations and understanding of yourself, prior to all of these activities, your primordial essence energy must have been peaceful joy because why else would you search for it? Would you want it? Would you desire it? If I, if I gave you an option of a perpetual adventure, you live forever and, it, and you're, you can have the perfect body forever and it's a perfect adventure and you can do whatever you want to, go to whatever star system, visit whatever, you could grow wings and fly and you could do whatever you wanted, imagine, whatever you imagined, you could have it all, fame, fortune, health and whatever, all of it. But you'd never have peace or you could have peace and nothing else, what would you choose? And be honest, Holy Son, because that was your choice and you chose adventure. And that's why you find yourself having everything experienced through 8 billion character body minds. All of it's experienced physically, through your projections. So you're all of it. But you you fucked up. Unfortunately, when you fractured yourself. And so you created a filter that prevents yourself, your little fractured localization, from absorbing the experiences of 8 billion. So from a localized worldview, you have no idea of the other 7 billion, 900,999. You just have no idea. Yet as the universal, the observer of the dream, you're experiencing all of it through every body-mind activity. And that's how you're aware of yourself as separate. You're conscious of yourself as separate. More correct term. This is your direct experience. You know that when you go still, meditate, which isn't actually what meditation is. Meditation is just pure awareness. But it's for the sake of this example. When you're sitting still and abiding, top of a mountain, sitting wherever, and you just be still, and you extend and you expand, you get a sense of something much larger than yourself. Something all-pervading, something all-encompassing. You've all had this. Why are you seeking for it? And when you're in that state, and there's no thought, there's just present, Moment, awareness. And it's an expansive awareness that is always now here. It's an expansive awareness that stretches out, yet is dimensionless. There's no dimension to it. How many dimensions are there? One, indivisible dimension. And you know that when you're in that present moment awareness, your beingness, that which is aware, is in a state of complete unity awareness, all of it's part of you. True wisdom is the realization that you don't know anything because there's no thing to know, that you are nothing because there's no thing to be. And what's the point of wisdom without love? And once true love, unconditional love, becomes your awareness, you realize that everything that appears and disappears, all of it, everything and nothing, all appears in awareness. It's all you. If we then bring it down to the localization, you're all aware when you harbor vengeance and grievance or resistance to what is, you suffer. You suffer your thoughts, you suffer your sensations, your feelings, your emotions. It makes you angry or you want to cry. It makes you sad or you're angry. The, the feminine part of you just goes sad, depressive. The masculine part of you gets angry and vengeful. It exists in both men and women. But you know that when you're not thinking about them, 
you're at peace. But they keep coming up. And so if you do the shadow work, which is you forgive. First, you forgive to not carry it. Secondly, you forgive it because you realize you're doing it to yourself. Mirrors, mirrors, vibrational, polar opposite energies attracting each other into quantum. Particles colliding, mirrors, the many me's out there, your enemies. And then you forgive because you realize this never really happened. And so when you forgive the memories, the many me's, the many ideas you had of what should have been, could have been, and you believed you deserved and were entitled to and didn't, when you forgive it all, you release yourself from expectation. And when you accept what is and accept this present moment awareness with no resistance, a sense of peace becomes you. You don't become peaceful. Peace becomes you. And when that peace is uninterrupted and peace is really quite still like a lake, perfect, reflecting the moon. But once that peace extends, there's a sense of joy. Peace is joy and stillness. Joy is peace and motion. You're aware of this. It travels through you. You experience it firsthand for yourself. Then if let's go into the direct experience. Every night you go to sleep. Every night you fall asleep. Every morning you wake up when the light comes. Something in your genetic programming, in your DNA, the melatonin in your brain kicks off and you fall asleep when it's dark and you wake up when it's light. You wake up when the light comes every morning. And in between, you disappear off somewhere. Part of it you don't remember. Yet you still breathe throughout the whole night. You wake up in the same place and the physiology hasn't really changed. Maybe you've aged a micromillimeter. Maybe one more wrinkle. Yet often you dream, and in every single dream, every dream while you're dreaming feels real because you've localized, you projected yourself into your dream, and you've localized, and your dream feels real to you. The characters in the dream appear to be real. Some are those that you know when you're awake. Some are just strangers that you meet for the first time. And you find yourself in a foreign country or a local country or a, the town you live in. But you've never questioned that everything you dream at night, you dream, you dreaming it up, you making it up, you constructing it, you're the architect of your dream. Watch the movie Inception, a dream within a dream. And even in your dreams, you dream. And some are chasing you, and some are your lovers, and some are your friends, and some have hurt you, and some have betrayed you. And you wake up sometimes in the morning with the vivid dream, with the memory still playing out of what you dreamt. And a day or two later, it's gone. You've forgotten it. And you've never questioned. As above, so below. Am I not just replaying the very thing that I am replaying daily? I fell asleep. I forgot my source. I imagined what I could be. I projected a universe. I projected myself into the universe so that I could experience the contents of my dreaming mind through billions of localizations, billions of characters, puppets on a string, each one thinking they have a mind of their own, a free will of their own, but they don't because I am dreaming them all up. And so I'm playing out a myriad of scripts of what I could possibly be, be through all those billions of characters I dream up when I dream, those characters that I've manifested in my dream content while I dream. And yet, surely you've questioned, it's what I'm doing now. And that which dreams me up cannot be separated from me. Because if I find myself localized in my dream and there's all these characters in my dream, then whatever has dreamt me up is just localized a part of itself, himself, herself as me through which that which dreams me experiences the content of its dream through me. And if I source it back, if I tap it back, if I trace back the steps like Hansel and Gretel, 
because there's enough signposts. I've read enough books that tell me, be still and know I am. Seek within or you will find nothing without. The observer of your dream. Be the observer. Choose again. I've got enough signposts. And if I go deeper and deeper and deeper, the recognition of my shared being with all of it is there. And at some stage, if I abide with willingness to be shown what I truly am, that which dreams, I that dream. Both this localization, every other localization throughout the universe, the universe itself, I that dreams, this whole dream, I observe and I realize that is what I am not. And therefore I must be that which is aware of all of this that I am not. And then I have to question why I dreamed. Why did I dream? Why am I dreaming? And as I come into the realization of what I am, I realize I've realized what I am by experiencing what I am not. And through the deductive reasoning process, which we all go through and is natural for all of us, made famous by Francis Bacon, written about by Francis Bacon. Look it up, deductive reasoning. Neti neti in Advita Vendanta. I started to realize I cannot be that. Because there's enough signposts. And as I find some of those signposts plausible, Beyond possible, plausible. I and my father, I and my source, energy, are one. One indivisible self. I've let go of all the fairy tales. No one's coming to save me. There's nothing to save. There's all to be. And once that comes into our awareness, it can't go away. Once you've dipped your foot in the ocean, you'll forever remember the feeling of water. Once you've licked your first ice cream, you'll forever remember the taste of vanilla. Once you've had warm rain on your face and been in a shower from the heavens, or smelt, smelt a, a Gauteng dust storm or the rain, the smell of the grass, you'll never forget it. Once you've had intimate connection, never leaves you. Once you felt the heat of a fire in a cold winter's night, you yearn for it when you're cold. It doesn't leave you. Once truth reflects back at you, itself, to itself, and there's a recognition of our one shared self, when you realize every single organism in this entire universe shares its essential energy, its essential nature with all of it, all of it is one indivisible organism, one indivisible dreaming mind, one indivisible self, one indivisible I am. And that I am is an extension of I am the extension of my source. I and my father are one. And in that realization, you start to realize, as I remember myself and without a shadow of a doubt with total clarity and complete conviction am aware of that which I am. That which I am knows itself. And the minute it knows itself, it remembers its source. Now, some are going to say that's not possible. Because the dreaming mind cannot be aware of the awake mind and the awake mind is unaware of the dreaming mind. The awake mind's very aware of the dreaming mind. It's not aware of the contents of the dreaming mind, but it's very aware that a part of itself is asleep and it calls to itself to awaken to itself. In actual fact, it's already over. It's already awoken to itself and recognized itself shares its essential nature with its source because it is the extension of source. The son is the extension of the father, to put it into story. 
father and son. It's just energy, just peaceful, joyous, unconditionally loving energy, light, ever extending, pure, unadulterated energy. And that's why no book, no process, no retreat, no mantra, no technique, no breathing, nothing is going to bring you to that. It gives you glimpses. But that recognition happens with complete willingness to let all of this go, all self-concept, all ideas of yesterday, past, tomorrow, future, all of it, let it all go. And through the abidance in total willingness and complete gratitude for the being of this, the awareness of being this and being the awareness, the willingness to be shown that none of this is real. And that this temporal, ethereal, separated body-mind identity does not exist, but as a mirror, as a filter to what is really there. And what is really there cannot be seen, can only be known, because it's invisible, yet indivisible. It's transparent, translucent, unseen, yet tangible more tangible than anything appearing physical material in space-time. And that's when you recognize that through the body-mind, every little bit of knowledge you've gathered, all those signposts you've accumulated as books and people and memories and places and, and sayings and posters and, and videos and all of it is worthless. It's worth nothing. The collective knowledge of the universe, all of it's pointless because it's not true. And therefore, no one really knows anything. And yet, the expression, the concession, experience of being, although impossible to explain to anyone in words, is completely real. And then we come upon the conclusion that everything I look upon, everything that appears and disappears, the entire universe, although there's an appearance to it, although it's a holographic illusion, all of it, all of it is reality, just misperceived. It's perfect snow with purple sunglasses, and therefore the purple snow appears, the snow, the perfect white snow appears as purple. But we have no idea what white snow is because we have purple glasses. And so we allow the glasses to be cleaned. We allow and we rest for them to be cleaned. We, are, we rest in God. Rest in peace. We rest in God and allow the clearance. But there's your tithing, your dedication to be shown that nothing you've ever wanted Nothing you've ever had, desired. All of it is meaningless. And there will be no memory of the you ever having existed when the real you awakens to itself, awakens to God. Like I've said before many a time, our greatest fear is not the fear of death. Our greatest fear is the fear of never having existed at all. Because the ego can't stand that. The ego is okay with your death because it'll just live through another 8 billion character body minds, especially those who grieve over your miserable death. And so God forbid it's forgotten, but God wills it so. What God really wills is that all of us body mind characters give up the ghost, just cease to exist as dream characters. So that that which dreams his son, a part of his mind that dreams, can awaken to his father and himself and continue to knowingly be the extension, the expression, the joyous lightness of being. I am. We are. The extension of love. I am. Full stop. God is. Full stop. And we cease to speak because no one knows shit. And to try and put it into words is always a concession. And yet there's a calling for us to share for free. Not to minister, 
This isn't Lou's ministry. There's no ministry here. It's just a dude. Just a guy. Just a normal Joe. Perhaps with a little bit more curiosity than most. Perhaps with a, a really strong inner desire to know. To be told not to take on a constant truth. Fact. Without a doubt. Well, it cannot be proven as pointless. To question everything. Why is it that people do this? Why should one behave that way? What is appropriate? And who decided? Who decided that? Fornicating under the consent of the king. Acronym. Fuck. Shouldn't be spoken about. Who decide? Who made up the rules? And they're constantly evolving anyway. Constantly changing. And so unless it's pure and clear and with total conviction, it remains in the realm of concept. It remains in the realm of ideology. Or just plain stupidity. Just a bunch of parrots regurgitating old songs without ever knowing the meaning, but never to be questioned. The direct experience or nothing at all. Can you hear these words? without commenting, without disagreeing. Oh I, oh, I disagree with you. I have to say something. Liz, you can't put comments. Unless I forget to tick that little thing that says no comments. But I need to I need to argue with you. I need to disagree. Really? You do? Why? Why? Why do you need to argue or disagree? Are you so insecure in yourself and your beliefs that you need to convince me that I'm wrong and you're right. I don't care. No, that's too polite. I don't give a fuck what you think. Not one bit. I really don't give a shit. You could think whatever you want to think. You could read a thousand books. You could have eight billion people agree with you. I still don't give a fuck. I care about you because I know you're an extension of me. But I know that you don't think, and therefore I don't care about what you think you think because you don't actually think. You're thought through. You've never had a thought. I'm thought through until I chose to no longer listen. And I switched that radio receiver off. And I listened to the silent stillness, the white noise. And through that, it was revealed. And now I only have a single thought. And that thought I share with my source, the Lord God of my being. Love is, God is, full stop. And to say you love God, but you hate others is a lie. It's blasphemy, bullshit. You've lied to yourself and to everyone else. Because to love God is to love everything God created. And what God created was his son. And what God, what God created is this universe through his son's dream. God didn't create the universe. God created his son, his son dreams. So if you want to love God, you need to first love him, the son, unconditionally, unconditionally, not this bullshit new age self-love. Let's go to retreat and pamper ourselves and tell ourselves we're wonderful. That's just egoic bullshit. That's, that's concessions for nonsense. True unconditional love is I accept all of it, not a single judgment about a race, about a color, about a people, about a nation, about a religion, about a nothing. Not a single judgment about a president, a politician, a pauper, the man on the street, not a single thought, therefore not a single judgment, except what is. Don't try and change anything, anyone. Don't try and convert anyone. Offer what you know for free. And don't go and give unsolicited advice. There's enough vices in the world. Eight billion souls. Don't be the A type. Don't be an R soul. Just be yourself. Authentic to your body-mind characteristics. Authentic to your illusionary nature. 
So you go to nature. Be authentic to this in your willingness to remember your true self. Be authentic to this in your true self when you're not resisting your illusionary self. Your true self will reveal itself because of your willingness, not because of what you are or how clever you are or how many books you've read or where you come from or what your parents did or your nationality or your psychic abilities or your whatever. Not because of any of that shit, but because of what God is. You don't awaken because you want to. You awaken because God calls you. And you're willing to surrender and let thy will be done. It's so simple. It's so obvious to this localization of itself, of remembering itself through this appearance. How did I get there? Through observation, through contemplation, through reading the signposts and then really going in. And then stopping, stopping the desire, the for, the dreaming for, the, the tenacity, never give up, push, push, create, manifest. I will never die. Fuck all of that. Stop. Sit on this rock and be still and be aware. And do not move and do not do another thing until total clarity and total conviction. Because then when I do, appear to do, I act only from a place of love. And I constantly keep checking in to make sure, why am I doing this? What's the purpose of this? Am I still coming from a place of love? Keep checking in. And constant vigilance, because that radio station will find your white noise station and try and chatter and yak yak. No, thank you. And be vigilant only for the voice for God, which is not a voice you hear, it's a knowing. And it's with total clarity and complete conviction. And if you're asking, how do you know it's the voice? Then it's not the voice. Because when the voice speaks, and it doesn't speak in words or symbols, it's an all-pervading knowing because it's just thought traveling at the speed of thought through that which appears as a body-mind, yet is a thought in a mind that dreams, which is a thought in the mind that is awake, which is a thought in the mind of God. And thought and spirit are synonymous. And so is awareness. And so is beingness. And so is now. And when that comes, the infinite lightness, lightness of being is all pervading. And the once upon a time, heavy darkness and sorrow of not being dissolves. Just this. Just this. Okay, so I'm going to share with you a very simple process which I pretty much came up with on my own by listening to many different teachers, speakers, and eventually through my own psychotherapy work and especially the hypnotherapy and regression work, eventually this came about. And this is was how I discovered self and the awareness of self and the present moment awareness of self and my shared beingness with my source and the complete clarity and awareness of it. And of course, this it just sounds like words, concessions to what cannot be explained. But let's move into the function. Let's get into, we're here localized as this, this body-mind. Do not deny this. Like I've said a hundred million times before, the universe, the world, people, places, things, and events are holographic projections, illusions, but that in which they appear, although it is asleep, that in which it appears is real. So even though what this appears as is an illusion, it's also simultaneously absolute reality. It's absolute reality appearing as something that it's not. So denying your experiences 
and denying the awareness hereof is completely blasphemous and pointless and will get you nowhere. So just be aware I am. If I was to say to you, do you exist? We're just going to use simple language and not try and make it too non-dual now. Do you exist? And don't try and get all esoteric and spiritual and try and answer it the way you think I want to hear it or needs to be here. If I was to say to you, do you exist? Your answer surely is, I do. And if I was to say to you right now, are you listening to me? I'm sure you're not thinking, am I listening to him or not? Surely your answer is, I am. So if I was to say to you, who is listening to me? Surely you would answer me as I am. And you'd maybe even point to yourself. I am listening to you, Lou. There's a you, Lou, on the screen. And there's an I watching my phone or my computer screen or participating live. I am listening to you. Let's not deny that experience right now. Let's not try and get too philosophical, spiritual, non-dual. Let's just, hey, here we are. This is our current, present moment reality. I am listening to you. Yes, fair enough. So now, I am aware of you. I, the subject, am aware of you, the object. Duality consciousness. I am now aware I'm in duality consciousness. I am aware of you. I am you are. You are, I am. There's a recognition. I don't know you, but I see you on my screen. Let's admit that. Let's just start there. I am aware of my body. Are you aware of your body? Are you aware of your legs, your feet, your hands? If you don't have your hands and feet, are you aware of the rest of your torso? Are you aware of what appears to be your body. You can look at it, look at your hands. Are you aware of your body? And your answer would be, I am aware of my body. Now, someone's going to say, oh, you should be saying conscious of your body. Conscious or aware in the realm right now, doesn't matter. Synonymous words. Are you aware of your body? And you would say, I am. I am aware of my body. Are you your body? Can you be aware of your body and be your body? What is aware that you are aware of your body? Are you the body aware of itself? Or are you something else aware of your body, which appears to be you, but you the awareness of that body? And surely you'd answer, I am. I'm aware of the screen, I'm aware of my body, and I'm aware that I'm aware of my body. I am, you would say. So let's think of a thought. Let's, let's make it easy. We're going to think of a yellow giraffe walking in the desert. And there we can imagine a yellow giraffe walking in the desert. It's got a funny walk. A mule pat, a camel horse in Afrikaans. A camel horse walking in the desert. A yellow camel horse walking in the desert. A giraffe in English. Are you aware that you're thinking of a giraffe? Are you aware of your thoughts of a giraffe walking in the desert? And your answer would be, I am aware of a thought of a camel, of a, <laughs> of a giraffe walking in the desert. Are you aware that you're aware of thought? And you would say, I am. So you're aware of your body, subject, object. You're aware of me and you, subject, object. And so body is no different to my body, your body, subject, object. That which is aware 
therefore must be the subject of awareness, aware of the object of which it's aware of, in this case, my body or the person on the screen or a yellow giraffe walking in the desert. So there's something which is aware of what appears to be others, what appears to be our body, and what appears to be our thought. Let's stay on thought for a second. Have you noticed how thought just pops in? You, you didn't choose to think of what should I do tomorrow. The thought, what should I do tomorrow, popped in. Or tomorrow I should take my car for a wash. Tomorrow I should clean the house. It was just the thought just popped up. You didn't think I should think about cleaning the house and now let's think about clean. The thought clean the house popped up. Do you realize that thoughts pop up just like this random thought that I've made you think of, yellow giraffe in the desert, thoughts just pop up. And the minute we engage them, we lose being aware of the thought as a thought external to that which is aware. We engage the thought and before you know it, the subject object merges and we become both subject and object and lost in translation. So now you're aware of the body on the screen talking to you, your body, which seems to be sitting or lying down or listening to me speak. And now you're aware of thought. Do you realize that's the realm of perception? You perceive me as a body, you perceive this as a body. You perceive thoughts of a body of a yellow giraffe walking in a body called the desert. You're aware of thoughts and objects. Now scratch your hand. Scratch your hand. You can tickle it or scratch it with your nail. Feel the sensation on the palm of your hand. Feel the sensation of a finger scratching the hand. Be aware of your body, the sensation of your body. Be aware of the sensation on your hand. So you're aware of subject object. You're aware of yourself as an object. You're now aware of that which is aware of the objects and aware of thoughts and aware of sensations. You are that which is aware of Subject, object, thoughts, sensations. Now, let's get into the sensation. You're scratching your hand. The sensation is it experienced in your hand. You can feel it in your hand. But where are you aware of it? Is the awareness of the sensation in your hand, the feeling and sensation, feeling is just more intense than a sensation, but what's aware of sensations and feelings? The sensation of a body, the sensation of a feeling, a hand, the palm of the hand, a nail. Are you aware of it there, or you are aware of it? What is aware of it? The answer is simple. It's the same answer. I am aware of being aware of thoughts, objects, feelings, and sensations. Now, that sensation is just scratching my hand, a feeling on the skin, a sensation of being scratched. Let's go to a past memory, which we bring immediately into the present by thinking about it. Think of the happiest day in your life. When your child was born, when you got a new puppy or a new kitten or a new job, and it was exciting. Where do you feel that sensation, that excitement, that feeling, that sensation? I've got the job. This new adventure. I've got the puppy. I've got the child. I've got the kitten. Where's the sensation? This, this, this is so exciting. I can't wait to start this new job. Or oh, this beautiful little kitten. This new dog, a new child. 
there's a there's a sensation awareness there's a feeling playing through me there's a sensation and a feeling and there's a perception and there's an awareness am i the feeling or am i that which is aware of feelings sensations objects perception are you aware that you're aware of all of this so if you're aware of thoughts sensations feelings object subject objects then you cannot be the subject object exclusively you cannot be the thoughts you cannot be the feelings you cannot be the sensations you are the awareness of all of them and since you are the awareness of all of them to be aware of them you must be one with them because you cannot be aware of something unless you one with it. You cannot be aware of an object unless you're aware of it. And therefore, to be aware of it, you must somehow be one with it, even if it's just in awareness. So what is aware? Is it something else other than you that is aware? Who is aware? I am. So the answer to all these questions, I am. I am this. I am the feeling, sensations. I am the perception. I am the awareness. I am awareness and feelings and thoughts and sensations. And I am aware. And if I'm aware of all of this and I'm aware of you then all of this must be contained in that which is aware. So not the body is aware. Not the sensation is aware. Not the feeling is aware. Not the objects are aware. In awareness, all objects, feelings, sensations appear and disappear. So what are you? Same answer. I am aware. I am the awareness of all that appears, feels, thinks, senses. I am the awareness thereof. Are you the objects, the feelings, sensations? No. you the awareness of thoughts, Sensations, feelings, emotions, perception. I am. Okay. So now you're still observing all of it. Now, did you perceive it before you observed it? Or did you observe it and then perceive it? Are you that which perceived it and then became aware of it and then attached yourself to it? Are the objects aware? Are the sensations aware? No. So you're the awareness which perceived itself as objects, sensations, feelings, emotions, out there, in here, all around. The awareness is what you are. That is moving into what the course calls the decision maker. Aware of being aware. Now the thought pops up. You're guilty. You did something wrong. You're unworthy. You're not good enough. You've no. sinned. You're a sinner. So sinner has done something wrong. Something wrong worthy of punishment. But you can't remember any of this. In your present moment awareness, it's just awareness. So where does the guilt come from? Where does the accusation come from? Where does any thought come from? 
if you are aware of the thought, the objects, the sensations, the feelings, you cannot be all those things. You must that be that which is aware of all. So when did you go from being aware of all of it to believing you are some of it and that some of it is outside you? How can you be aware of all of it and yet something's outside you? Have you allowed this to filter through? Has it come into your realization of what is aware and what is not aware? What's not aware? The objects aren't aware. The sensations aren't aware. The feelings aren't aware. The objects outside are unaware of the subject-object relation. So what's aware? I am. I am aware. So if you are that which is aware, then none of the thoughts that pop up are real, are yours, are worthy of your attention. But you realize that if a thought pops up, it says you are guilty, you've sinned, you've done this, you did that, you were bad, you were cruel, you were guilty, you are suffering. If I engage the thought from being I am aware, from being I am, the next thing I go into, because I am is just a doorway. It's just a genderless awareness. It's a non-event. But the minute I go into the what the thought tells me I am, I am a sensation a feeling, an emotion, a body, observing other bodies, I have moved out of from I am to I am this, I am that. And the minute I go, I am this, and I am that, and I could be this, and look at that, and look at that doing this to that, and I am experiencing what that is doing to this, you've gone into, the thoughts captured you, and taken you down a rabbit hole, and what are you no longer aware of? The I am. You're not aware of the objects, Yourself as an object, which has now become a subject, observing other objects, the object experiencing feelings, sensations, thoughts, and emotions, no longer aware that it is neither the body, nor the feelings, nor the sensations, nor the emotions, nor the subject, nor the object, nor the judger. It's just completely being trapped in the story. And man, it comes in different spins. This week it was... I was a terrible mother or a terrible daughter or a terrible son or a terrible aunt or a terrible whatever. And this week it's your something else. So you've gone and asked for forgiveness with all those people. And this week it's playing out. You were, you avoided the dog. You knocked over a horse when you were a kid. It'll just come up in another way. It wants to drag you from being aware of the thoughts that pop in, become caught up with, engaged with, become sensations, become feelings, become emotions. It traps you. It wants to keep you there. It wants to keep you unaware that you are that which is aware. I am aware. And if I pay no more attention, I just, I am. Aware of what? Pure awareness. And what happens when a thought tries to tempt me? A thought of sin, fear, and guilt, of unworthiness, of rejection, of abandonment, of not good enough. No, thank you. We now know the thought doesn't come from self. We now know thought gets presented from somewhere, but not from I am. When I am, I am, I am, peace, I am, here now. I am awareness. Awareness is peace. But the thought wants to engage again. You're back so soon. Go away. Yeah, but you meant to work through me. I heard in a spiritual retreat, you must work on your shadows. You must look at me. You must invite me in. You must sit with it. You need to feel it, sense it. You need to cry, especially in front of others. You need to show them how vulnerable you are. Shut the fuck up. Shut 
the fuck up. Get away from me. Get behind me, Satan. You will speak no more. I will listen no more. You are not my thoughts. I am not these feelings. I am not the sensations. I am not these emotions. I am not this body. There are no other bodies outside. I am this in which all of it appears. I am the pure awareness thereof. But spiritual people say, it's your shadows. You must do your shadow work. Embrace your shadows. Hug your shadows. Shut the fuck up. How's your shadow work served you? They love to sell you shadow work shit. That's how they make their money. Their lives, of course, are perfect. Spiritual teachers' lives are perfect. They don't have any issues. They're all happily married with seven children, perfect lives, perfect jobs, abundance. Happy, wonderful. They don't live off anybody's donations. It's divine providence. The Lord provides. Shut the fuck up, you fucking charlatan. Don't listen to the voice. God has no voice. The Holy Spirit's voice is not a voice. You needed a story. So use the word voice. It's an awareness. And when you are the awareness, why are you engaging with thoughts that are not your own? Why are you giving attention to thoughts, sensations, feelings, emotions, stories? They attach to a story. Then you go from the sensation, the disease, the unhappiness, the pain, and now there's a story. You're not happy. You're so struggling. You're suffering. You don't know what to think. You don't know what to plan. You don't know what to do. It's all you. You're a fuck up. You're a mess. You're not worthy. Why should anyone love you? You fucked up. You're a sinner. You're being punished. You deserve the shit. Shut the fuck up. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus, ego, same shit. That's what Jesus was saying. Shut up. Shut up, voice. Be still and know I am. The word of God. It's just a story. God's word. It's just a story. No word. First there was the word and the word became form. It's no word. Don't re read biblical shit and try and put it into non-dual. Drop all those beliefs, all those stories, everything you've been told. Right here, right now, you make the decision. I am. Pure awareness. Say it. Say it out loud. Speak it. Bring it into vibration. Bring it into the recognition of our shared being. I am. God is. Everything else is a lie. I am aware of the awareness I am. I am not this. I am not that. I am not my thoughts. I am not my past. I am not these sensations. I am not these feelings. I am not this body. I am not all of that. This has nothing to do with me. I am not a body. I am free. I am still as God created me. And what did God create me from? Himself. And what is God? Pure energy. And therefore, what did God create as an extension of himself? Pure energy. And I fell asleep and imagined I could think apart from him. And the only thought I think with God is the extension of the love he is. And I imagined I could think. And thinking became sensation. Sensation became feelings. Feelings became emotions. Emotions became stories. But the guilt remained. The fear remained. And so I tried to push it outside myself. And the stories became them. 
and us. My stories, people, places, things and events. Trace it all back. Return. Deep breath. In, out. Awareness of awareness. Not the thoughts. Not the feelings. Not the sensations. None of it. The pure awareness I am. fell asleep when I dreamt this, but I am that which observes it. And I am that before I observed all of this. I am that before the dream was formed. I am that. I am. I am God is. That's the ultimate truth that can be shared in words. Nothing else can be understood. Nothing else can be made sense of. Nothing else makes senses. The five senses, the five obstacles to peace make no sense of any of it. You can't make sense of a senseless dream. No matter how real it appears, it appears really real every time you dream. Every night you dream, you dream, when you're localized in your dream, it feels real. This feels real. You dream but this. I now invite the Lord God of my being, the awareness of the awareness I am, the present moment awareness of I am into my awareness. Take over. I surrender all of this for the peace of God. I surrender all of this for the awareness of I am. I and my Father are one. I surrender all of it to be knowingly that I am one with my Father, with my source, with this Lord God of my being, with the source of all creation, of this which is aware. I am now aware of thoughts, feelings, sensations, emotions, us and them, people, places, things, and events, a universe. I localized. I'm experiencing the contents of my dream through this. I took this seriously. I try to identify, give it an identity, give it a name, give it a, a title, a, a, a purpose, a career. And I bought into all of that. And then I had hopes and dreams. And I lost the awareness of the awareness I am. It's the awareness I am that connects with the awareness we all are. Shared invisible being. The I am in me is the I am in you. The love I am recognizes the love you are. Love is the absence of bodies. Love is the substrata. Love is awareness. Awareness is God. When I am aware, I am one with that which is aware. And what is it aware of? All that is. And all that is, is pure awareness. God's love is all there is. Awareness and God are one. Awareness is God. Present moment awareness is here now. Here now is God. God is energy. God is pure and adulterated, unconditional love energy played out through this body-mind vessel, this that which observes. It is peaceful joy. It is always here. Hey, you. Who's listening to me right now? I am. One shared indivisible self. That which observes is the same. It's that which observes. It is the I am. We all are. I am. God is. There comes a thought. And the yellow giraffe. What happened to the yellow giraffe? You left it out in the desert. It's dying of starvation. There is no giraffe. There is no desert. It's going to tell you a story to hook you. It knows this predisposition is an animal lover. Now you've left the giraffe out in the desert. Okay, but you come across the cat tomorrow and it's starving, a kitten in the shopping center. What do you do? You feed it, you give it water, you pick it up, you take it home, you take care of it. Why? It came into your path, it asks you for help. It's love calling for love to be itself knowingly. It's not you being loving towards the cat by rescuing it. It's love calling itself to recognize its love. You see an atrocity, a child being hurt, an abuse. You act. And sometimes you can do it gently. Sometimes you need a fucking growl. 
Sometimes it's a Glock with a Hydra shock. Sometimes it's a bullet through the fucking head. Because it comes from a place of love. Not under my watch. You ain't going to go around raping children. But it's still love. It's not, oh, let's just sit in the monastery and invite you all in and hold hands and sing Kumbaya when there's atrocities going on around you. Parts of yourself forgotten itself, acting out in the most violent way towards itself. You act. And sometimes it's a gentle, kind word in the elevator when you bump into a kid. And it's sometimes helping them grow nice old lady across the road. And sometimes it's just helping whatever. And sometimes if you're designed with that propensity and you've got the skills that makes Taken look like an amateur, then you act. And sometimes you fucking growl. Because that's the only way the A-type soul listens. But you never forget I am. And you never forget the awareness of I am. And even while you act, you act from a place of love. Because it's calling itself to equalize. Bring it back into the awareness of the awareness I am. You see, cowards all say, Namaste. I say, no more stay. Not under my watch. Because it's all of me. And if I know a part of my finger has got cancer, I chop it off to save the hand, to be around long enough to fully transcend into awareness. I don't let the cancer continue in the world of men and horses. But that's this body-mind apparitions made peace with this and has chosen to serve this way to all of its fractured selves. If it, if it means a double backhanded Jesus slap across the chops every now and again. Because this is what's real for me. All of it is reality appearing as something it's not. And sometimes what is not needs to be shaken into recognition of the reality I am, we are, God is. Problem with spiritual community is you think spiritual is something. You've given it substance. It's a joke. Spirituality is is a joke. The spiritual are lost in translation. Anyone that labels themselves spiritual is lost. You're not spiritual. You're absolutely fuck all. You're nothing. You're pure awareness. And that is no thing. Awareness isn't something. So when I say you're fuck all, I mean it. You are fuck all. You're nothing. You're going to get that on a David retreat. But you are no thing. Yet you are that in which everything appears and disappears. The world is an illusion in terms of what it appears as. The universe is an illusion as what it appears as. When you dream at night, whatever you dream of is an illusion appearing in your mind. And you are very real, holy son of God. But you're not this. That you're not. Do you get the message? You're not this. And sometimes, as gentle as you are, you needed to find the rogue to shake your little fucking world upside down in order to remind you of what you truly are. Because the gentle stuff didn't work. The myriad of disappointments and disillusions and beatings weren't enough. And even on your journey back to God, you needed to find a road to kick you up the behind. Light up your Uranus all the way up to your third eye. Kundalini sparking with fucking fairy dust. Because it wasn't enough. And so the direct path. None of this is real. Yet all of it appears in that which is absolute reality just appearing as something it's not. But you do not deny this, and you do not deny the world, and you do not deny your apparent suffering. You just observe it and recognize that which observes is real, 
and that which is it's observing is a false perception of what never happened and is already over. But it doesn't appear to be as long as you still seek for something in this world, special love, excitement, joy, peace, or some form of specialness, while you still seek for something in the plane of fools and horses, you will get your ass kicked. Often, repeatedly, even until your dying breath. Because it's designed that way. You designed it because it doesn't want you. you. That part of you that is filled with fear and regret and remorse and forgetfulness and knows not what it is and has imagined a vengeful God fears the real you awakening to self and will not let you go gently into the light because it means its demise, even though it's not real. And you feed it with your questions and with your searching, and with your doubt about what you are. Holy Son of God. So repeat after me. Deep breath in, abide. Here's the thoughts. There's the sensations. Here's the feelings. Subjects, objects. return. I am God is Amen No more words are needed and every time every single time thought, sensation, feeling, emotion resistance to what is you will remember this return to here now present in your moment awareness. I am goddess. No more stories. No more stay.